Uh, welcome to the 27th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item three in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. The second item of business today is to hear evidence from a panel of transport stakeholders in relation to the committee's inquiry into air quality in Scotland. Can I welcome Chris McRae, who's the head of uh, policy at the Freight Transport Association, Philip Matthews, the chair of Transform Scotland, Alex Quayle, senior policy officer for Sustrans, and Paul White, the director of government relations at Confederation of Passenger Transport. UK. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, as you can imagine, members have a series of questions for you. We'll get straight into those. Uh, Kate Forbes. I'm just going to start with a, a very broad question and allow each of you to come in as to whether you think that the Scottish Government's work to date um, on air quality is adequate to meet legal requirements in the medium to long term. Who wants to kick off? Paul White. Um, I think that the uh, the work so far is in the right direction. Um, as you would imagine from uh, my perspective, uh, a key to meeting air quality targets and through steps like low emission zones is through um, framing bus as an integral part of the solution uh, to air quality rather than villainising it. So um, I think there's more to be done in that and more to be done in unlocking the benefits that are associated with a strong comprehensive bus network. And that is maybe through measures that you might not associate with air quality policy, but creating a stable framework of um, bus policy that allows operators the certainty to accelerate <coughs> investment and invest in, in new services. Thank you. Yeah, I'd um, like to talk about the air quality management areas. So whilst uh, Clean Air for Scotland, I think, is a, is a strong policy and has seen us move generally in the right direction, the fact that that has increased from 34 to 38 in the last year suggests that the direction of travel isn't yet going in the right direction. Um, it is heartening that the consultation will look at air quality management, sorry, the consultation for low emission zones will look at air quality management areas by 2023, but that is, as you say, that's a, that's a long-term goal. So whilst the long-term, I'm quite confident, um, I think short and medium term, there is room for progress. Phil Matthews. Uh, yes, I, mean, I agree with um, a lot of what's been said by the previous two speakers. Uh, I think it's welcome that we have an air quality strategy. I think the proposals in the low emission zones are welcome, but we think we, we could go further than that. We'd like to see one in every uh, every city with an AQMA uh, at present. We'd like to see that introduced as soon as possible. Um, but I, and I think the commitment to uh, the ending of combustion engines by 2032 is welcome. But I still think electric vehicles and so on, that's a very challenging thing to roll out in terms of um, changing the, the fuel source for our, our vehicles on roads. And I think underpinning all of this is uh, um, a, a transport strategy and an overall approach to transport which is predicated on still despite what the transport strategy says uh, has, has resulted rather I should say in uh, you know a growth in car transport inadequate funding for for walking and cycling um, and not really backing the transformational change that we need to see in terms of all the wider benefits not just air quality but public health and so on as well so uh, in the medium to long term, I think some of the, the actions in the air quality strategy and the low emission zones proposals and so on are very welcome. Um, I think we have to look in a much more strategic way at the overall investment in transport, what we're proposing uh, in terms of different modes and so on, uh, and how we incentivize people to choose more healthy and lower polluting forms of transport. Okay. Chris McRae. Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, obviously, overall, the direction is, is, is moving uh, in, in the right uh, way. I think we have obvious concerns about implications for freight and servicing of deliveries in Scotland's, uh, in Scotland's major cities. Um, the emission standards from commercial vehicles is improving and will improve dramatically over time with the Euro 6 uh, standards uh, for, heavy, for heavy goods vehicles, uh, also the standards for, 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 for vans as well. Uh, but I think there's got to be an element of, of time given for those uh, benefits to actually filter, uh, to, to actually filter through. Okay. okay. Some of you have touched on this already, but do you feel that there's an adequate focus on active travel in the cleaner air for Scotland strategy, and how would you develop it if not? 
May I come in? Um, yes, I, mean, I think the, the, the recent doubling of funding for active travel, very, very welcome. Um, we're still seeing the vast majority of our transport spend on roads, um, 3 billion on the A9, 3 billion on the A96 upgrade, and so on, whereas we're talking about 80 million for, for active travel. Um, and I think that's disappointing. What we'd like to see is, is moving towards a situation where 10% of the Scottish Government's transport budget is focused on active travel. And then I think you start seeing the, the, the real transformational change, hopefully, in our cities and in public health and other things as well as part of that. So, um, yes, there has been progress. Yes, there's an acknowledgement about the importance. Yes, we have a cycling strategy and a walking strategy, and that's all good. But the cycling strategy sets a target of 10% cycling by 2020, and I don't think anyone is claiming that we're actually going to meet that 1%, 2% just now. So uh, clearly we need to move a lot faster and in a lot more bold uh, way than we're doing at present. <clears throat> With regard to um, uh, promoting active travel within Cleaner Air for Scotland, I think part of the problem is Cleaner Air for Scotland is focused, when it talks about transport, it talks more about different types of vehicles. And it's not just about a different type of vehicle that pollutes less, it's also about having fewer vehicles in uh, urban centres. So even if we are talking about electric vehicles, whilst they do have a fundamental role to play in future urban mobility, we'll still see uh, particulate matter from the brakes and from tyres, of which there's no safe limit. So it's not just about making sure that we have vehicles that are polluting less, it's also about making sure that we are taking space within urban environments to give to people to walk and cycle so that it's safer for people to cycle so that more people will change their behaviour to a less polluting mode. So CAFs could do more to meet that problem head on, that there is, there is a problem of too many vehicles in our, in our urban areas. Question um, Director Paul White. What discussions has the CPT had with the Scottish Government in relation to evaluating and reinstating the bus investment fund and what impact has the reduction in the bus services um, operating grant on operations, operators grant on operations? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> the bus investment fund um, was a, a useful pot of money that um, I think it was three million a year over three years to um, kickstart uh, infrastructure projects. That was, I think it came to a conclusion about two years ago and we were told there would be a report that followed that to evaluate its success. Um, I think in the first year it was hugely oversubscribed. Um, you know, it's, I think there's some good ideas out there at the local authority level and with, and with operators uh, and the, that money could have been put to good use. Uh, but we're still awaiting that report. So it's uh, it's frustrating in a way that we, you know you can't move forward with any any innovative projects that you might have had an eye on progressing through that fund. With regards to uh, the bus service operators grant, uh, there is a, a base rate of 14.4 pence per passenger kilometre and a top up rate which is um, was the same if your vehicle qualified as a low carbon vehicle. Uh, that's been cut to 10.1 pence the top up rate, the base rate remains the same. Uh, so that is, you could say that flies in the face of the work that is done through the Green Bus Fund to incentivise operators to, to purchase low carbon vehicles, because on one hand you're incentivising them to purchase the vehicle, and on the other hand you're saying, well, there's, there's so many of them, we're going to have to cut the rate. So it, it makes it difficult for an operator to invest, to make that investment case for a low carbon vehicle, because you know the rate that you receive through BSOG. Um, is reduced. Can, can, I, can I just pick up on that point? Because yeah. one could argue that there has already been substantial public subsidy provided um, through the Green Bus Fund mm -hmm. and that you're actually in a way looking for a double subsidy of that. I'm not saying that's necessarily my view, but, but you could yeah. argue that point. Um, and I guess that leads us on to the wider moral question about the extent to which the bus operators have a responsibility to behave in an environmentally responsible way and the extent to mm -hmm. which public, the public purse has to incentivise them to sure. do that. Okay, well, I would say that the Green Bus Fund uh, is up to 80% of the price differential between a standard vehicle and a, a low carbon vehicle. So the vast majority is still the, paid for by, by the operator and that's the 80% is the maximum level. If you want to be a successful bidder for the Green Bus Fund, you probably have to pitch your bids lower than that 80%. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so. It is, it's helpful, but I think the Green Bus Fund has, has 
incentivised the purchase of about 300 low carbon vehicles through its uh, span um, and that's about roughly half the number of low carbon vehicles there are in Scotland so it's not the extent that operators are saying we're not going to invest in low carbon okay. vehicles unless it's through the Green Bus Fund um, and operators are continuously working to uh, update their fleet, green their fleet but there's such a cost involved that especially when you have uncertainty over the larger framework of things like BSOG and um, the um, the transport bill, where you, 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 your business might be uh, franchised, uh, without that, without with that uncertainty, it's difficult to make a case for uh, accelerating that fleet investment, or you might choose to pause it even. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? No. Phil think, Matthews. Uh, yeah, I think overall, um, I mean, the, the subsidies for buses are a, a very small percentage of the overall transport budget. Uh, we've seen bus uh, usership in Scotland decline, you know, quite significantly. There's clearly a social justice aspect to that. This is the, the you know, a lot of people in Scotland don't have access to a car, and that is their main mode of travel. Um, so I, I think, you know, obviously you have to look at the detail of individual schemes, but I think overall, the, the money that's allocated to support buses uh, is, is not is not a huge amount. I'd also say that I think there's lots of other things that need to be done in terms of buses, uh, in terms of providing road space for buses, bus preferential corridors, and so on as well. And, we saw a big rollout of that maybe 20 years ago that had a, a positive impact and we've seen some retreat or stalling on that in the last few years. So uh, I think overall in the round, again, we need to think more about how we can reinvigorate buses within Scotland and make them greener as well. Okay. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Just wondering in relation to the Green Bus Fund, if there's been any analysis about the number of vehicles that would need to be retrofitted in order to meet the government's aspirations for the low emission zones. Um, so we had a figure, I think, plucked out the air last week at committee that there would need to be a thousand buses in Glasgow alone. But I, I, don't know, I don't know what kind of analysis the industry has done themselves on that. And that would be a separate fund, I would imagine, the, well, to show you the, the lack of uh, certainty that there might be an investment, the Green Bus Fund this year was, which is usually fully taken up, is about three million a year. It was about half of it was taken up and about half of it wasn't. Uh, I think 1.4 million went to green buses and the rest wasn't taken up. And I, I believe that there are discussions, I've got, I, it's not set in stone, but I believe there's discussions that some of that money might be used then to, as, a, as a separate retrofit pot mm -hmm. to um, allow operators to, to bid for money to retrofit vehicles. But you're right that there is, um, I don't have figures as the amount of buses across Scotland, I can get back to you on that, that would, that would maybe qualify. Um, but retrofit is, I would say, it's not the golden bullet. I mean, there's, to, to, to solve this issue, it's a, a swift and cost-effective means to bring certain vehicles up towards a Euro 6 standard. But um, there are other factors, such as it, um, it lowers um, your um, fuel efficiency. There is increased maintenance cost. So you might make a, uh, an improvement in NOx, but you might worsen carbon emissions. Um, and I, I think there's the London through TfL have had experience of doing a lot of retrofit, and I think they'd say they've got the, the bruises to show for it, and so there's some lessons to maybe learn as to how best to do it, um, because I think it's maybe part of a larger package that might involve things like scrappage or things like lead-in periods to allow operators to invest, but over a longer period of time, if we're going to reach uh, Euro 6 standards. Okay. Do anybody else want to come in on that? No? Finley Carson? You know, I've got a number of questions. Uh, firstly, to, to, to all the panel, uh, I'd like to ask whether you think Scotland should have more ambitious targets than the EU minim minimum in relation to air quality. Can we start with Chris. Um, well, uh, that's obviously a political matter for you know Scottish government to decide or you know what they want to do with it. Um, it. It's certainly, you know, true to say that it's an ambitious uh, target and that presents, you know, challenges certainly for the freight uh, sector in terms of in terms of meeting it. Like I said before, with Euro 6 standards for uh, commercial vehicles, air quality emissions from goods vehicles are going to improve. The issue with low emission zones and their introduction is if it creates sort of a temporary hiatus in the meantime. Uh, and what it means in terms of fleet replacement, particularly for smaller and medium-sized enterprises, uh, and what that means in terms of you know supplying Scotland cities and the costs that ultimately pass on to the consumer. Anybody else wish to comment on that? No. Finally, Carson, do you want to? Um, when when we're looking at uh, transboundary impacts of air pollution, how can Scotland's approach be more agile to to address? 
the Clean Air for Scotland's vision of the air, our air quality being best in Europe? No. <laughs> to it. If, um, I think that the, it's a simplistic answer, but it comes from the approach, and that should be that the owner should be on the polluter, not to, uh, the, on the polluter to reduce the pollution. So, yes, transboundary is a problem with um, um, the monitoring and acting upon it, but if we can set the policy so that it's the polluter themselves that are disincentivised, that would be at the root of it. Any other comments? No. Um, what, what work, we've heard uh, some in previous answers, but I'd, I'd like to uh, go into a little bit more detail. What work are the freight and pa uh, passenger transport sector doing to improve pollution? Um, and do you think there's adequate resources directed at guidance and information to help you facilitate that? And uh, what improvements do you see uh, that could help you in the future? Uh, our individual operators or members are investing as best as they can in uh, greener vehicles. You will have seen, uh, for example, Lothian Buses received some press recently about the, uh, their um, service, which is electric vehicles. Um, so there's definitely investment happening. Um, we are working with Transport Scotland. We're working with local authorities to make the case for um, putting bus at the centre of the solution. Uh, and with Transport Scotland saying provide a stable framework for us, so um, no cuts to BSOG, um, and we're saying to local authorities, let's see how we can work together to, um, through partnership, through statutory quality partnerships, or through whatever partnership model emerges from the Transport Scotland Bill, to say we can, if, if you tackle this problem with congestion, if you allow buses to uh, up their speeds, that improves the environmental performance, uh, and quid pro quo, if you do that, we will have, uh, we will have um, resources free to offer a better service, or have more money to invest in newer vehicles. So it's about trying to encourage that partnership to allow us to deliver what better. Can I just pick up on that point? Because yeah. you're right, there are some very good examples out there, Lothian buses, Stagecoach, and my constituency, who are doing a lot of good work in this area. But is that happening across the board? Are there very good examples and people, people who are lagging behind? And I guess, leading on from that, are the smaller operators lagging behind? Because it's more difficult, perhaps, for them to kind of buy into this. I, I think, well, our current chair of CPT, we have a, annually we collect a chair, and is, is Sandra Whitelaw, who runs a, a bus company called Whitelaws. And their fleet is um, completely low carbon. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> there are examples of, of smaller to medium-sized operators who are doing some fantastic work. Okay. Some who are smaller who may, may find that you know there's just monetary issues that don't allow them to update the fleet. So they will they will have vehicles that are perfectly road legal and up to a certain standard, but they wouldn't be low carbon vehicles, they wouldn't be that modern, but they serve a, a, a role, particularly in rural areas where it's very difficult to make an investment case for a, a spending a, a lot of money in a you know a, a low carbon vehicle. Uh, where air, air quality is not such a big issue and you um, in that area or you may be running uh, supported services it's through the local authority where you've got to have a local you know they want a low cost tender so if you have a spent all this money in the bus your tender is going to be so much higher than somebody who's maybe got a slightly older vehicle so it, it varies across the patch okay so does anybody else want to come in on finley carson's question Chris McRae, do you want to talk from, from a freight, a freight point, point of view? Uh, obviously, it's a wholly private sector uh, activity. Like I've mentioned already, there's a lot of freight placement going on you know, with the Euro 6 uh, standard. And all effectively an LEZ does is just buy forward that benefit that's naturally coming. Anyway, just, you know, it just seeks to sort of bring, that, bring that forward. Um, as I've mentioned before, I think a concern would be a bit smaller to medium-sized enterprises, their ability to replace vehicles. The other thing I would say is, that although we talk about the freight sector, there's actually different sectors within that. Uh, you know, some companies, because of their fleet replacement policies, effectively this isn't going to be an issue because you're going to have Euro 6 standards, you know, across the board very soon in some companies. In others, where they keep the vehicles for much longer because the vehicles do a lot lower mileage, and I'm thinking of the companies here involved in like, food distribution, etc., there is going to be a natural lag in terms of the vehicle uh, emission standards. That said, a lot of those companies are also looking at use of electric fridges on vehicles, refrigerated vehicles, I mean, use of electric fridges rather than uh, diesel-powered fridges. And again, that cuts down uh, on emissions. The one point I would want to, to also make, and colleagues from the buses sector have touched on it, is a bit efficient use of road space and partnering. Um, obviously, as with any vehicle, 
the most inefficient way to operate a commercial vehicle is slowly and in stop-start traffic. That's the most inefficient way in terms of uh, emissions. We did a lot of work with Glasgow City Council during the Commonwealth Games about piloting nighttime deliveries where we had to just because of the physical uh, restrictions that were going on with the Games. Um, and you know, we'd like to see one of the sort of legacy benefits from that um, being you know, greater flexibility in hours and delivery, greater use of road space, uh, priority given to commercial vehicles in terms of things like traffic calming, or rather avoiding traffic calming for commercial vehicles. Uh, because again, that is a, another way of reducing uh, emissions uh, in, in, in the actual city, city environment. Um, David Stewart wants to come in. I can imagine what he's looking to, to explore. <laughs> uh, thank you, Convener. Um, could I just ask Chris McCrea about the sort of uh, uh, Dutch model of consolidation centres and the previous session of Parliament, uh, the committee. Transport Committee visited one and was very impressed with the model. Uh, as members may know, this is where uh, freight goes to an external site and low emitting uh, vehicles used to take the freight from one area to, to another, unless there's a one-off drop to a large supermarket. Um, for example, I was on an um, electric freight bike, which was I've never come across before. But I was very impressed with that, and I understand that I think one of the I think Sterling was being looked at by one of the transport companies to try and model that. Have you had any experience of that? No. Yes, I mean, as FT, we're involved with the Scottish Freight Logistics Advisory Group of Transport Scotland, and I actually chair the Urban Freight subgroup of that, which is actually producing, hopefully this quarter, um, guidance uh, on best practice in terms of urban deliveries and looking at how planners, local authorities, developers, businesses that generate freight, and obviously the freight operators, can work together. The issue of uh, consolidation centres obviously you know, has come up a number of times and there have been previous studies, particularly in the Glasgow area, the SPT, the Regional Transport Partnership, uh, looked at it. The, the issue with distribution uh, with consolidation centres is what it does in terms of the actual supply chain. If it involves another break in the bulk, another uh, handling leg, then it obviously brings up extra cost. Now, so far in the UK, I think there's about two operating examples of consolidation centres operated at a local authority level. I mean, one's in, I think, Bath, which is funded, uh, the other's in, uh, at Heathrow Airport, which is basically a, a security type uh, thing. Um, I mean, I could be, you know, slightly blasé and say, well, you know, Glasgow's got a consolidation centre, it's called Bells Hill, you know, it's called the, 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 the regional distribution centres for the, the major distribution companies that operate, operate around there. Um, I think if we're bringing in extra sort of breaks in the supply chain legs like that and using low emission vehicles for that final last mile, it obviously puts up costs, that's got an implication in terms of the goods in the actual shops, because somebody's going to pick up that cost, unless of course it's going to be funded by the state or via the local authority in some, in, in some way. But what I would say is that, you know, that the freight sector does, it is incentivised by the margins in the sector to make the most efficient use of vehicles and the most efficient use of load space and to minimise empty running. So in a sense, there's a degree of self-regulation on that anyway, you know, from an economic point of, point, point of view. So the, the ambitions that a consolidation centre is trying to achieve, the freight sector is in a sense completely aligned to in terms of the self incentivisation on it from the economic point of view. Thank, thanks for letting me back in, Convener. I, I just wondered, is there enough carrot or, or stick to, to drive technology when it comes to uh, a freight transport uh, with, with articulated lorries and whatever? Um, you, you know, you mentioned it was, uh, it's mostly private sector, and I know the public sector's driven, uh, and so we, we're seeing a, a, a rapid increase in improvement in buses and electric buses come on, on uh, online. Is there, is there enough pressure on uh, the, the freight industry when it comes to lorries to, to develop uh, electrical engines or whatever? Um, and is that something you, you would see that would need significant support from, from government? I think there's, there's certainly stakes at the moment in forms of you know, low emission zones, etc., being, being proposed. I think in terms of carrots, uh, no, there probably is a lack of that. I mean, what we have seen, uh, and I mean this in a wider UK context, not specifically in the context of Scotland, is changes in UK government policy, for example, over the years in terms of support for alternative, financial support for alternative uh, fuels for commercial vehicles. The reality is there isn't really an option on diesel at the moment. I mean, electric is really not there for long distance operations. Local distance, yes, but we've, we've talked about that already. Uh, the gas network in terms of gas refuelling for commercial vehicles over longer distances, it's developing, it's not there yet. So we're in this period where there's technology that will be coming along, but we're just not 
quite there yet. What is important is that government, and I mean that in the wider sense, whether it be UK or uh, Scottish government, if they are setting up policies of support for alternative fuels, they need to have a long-term consistency in that approach because we've seen at a UK level examples of supports given to um, one type of alternative fuel and then just taken away after operators have made investments in, 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 in that. And in a private sector environment, that's a really difficult thing to justify where you don't have long-term fiscal certainty. Certainty. So, yes, support for areas like that would be welcome, but it's going to be long-term committed support. Moving on, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, and good morning to you all. Um, uh, I think I, I would like to explore further with, with all of you the adequacy of the Scottish Government's approach. Um, but just uh, if I could, um, uh, Mr McRae, ask you a question about whether you see there being a relevance um, to moving from um, road to rail for freight in terms of, of the discussions we're having this morning and if you have any further comments on that before I ask the other questions. Absolutely. I mean, one of my other jobs at the FTA is I'm head of their UK rail freight uh, policy uh, work. Um, rail freight across the UK and in Scotland as well probably represents about 10% of surface transport. Rail freight is good for doing certain things, but it has to work in partnership with road freight. I mean, there's going to be a road leg to a rail journey either at the beginning or the end or some cases, in most cases, probably, uh, probably both. Um, in terms of you know urban freight and, and urban deliveries, um, I mean while rail can take things right into the city centre, there's then got to be a road distribution leg you know at the end uh, at the end of it. There have been trials done at uh, Euston Station uh, in London of bringing goods in by night into the station and then taking them away in road uh, vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, the infrastructure to do that at many stations, including, for example, Glasgow Central, um, has been removed over the years. Actually, vehicular access to our major stations, uh, Glasgow Central, Edinburgh, Waverley, which used to exist for like, parcels and mail traffic, is physically being taken away, so there are uh, physical difficulties uh, with that. The other thing, of course, just to point out about rail freight is that rail freight overall is less polluting than road freight because of the amount of tonnage that can be shifted per you know, gallon of diesel burned. But the individual uh, uh, per units of freight trains are actually far more polluting than commercial vehicles. The, the benefit comes from moving larger volumes, and that's why it's more suited to bulk hauls and to longer distance traffic, like Anglo-Scottish retailer traffic with likes of the Russell Group or, uh, or the Malcolm Group, rather than sort of, you know, urban freight distribution. All right, thank you. And uh, could I ask all the panel um, for a response to this question about what innovative measures you see should be put in place to discourage polluting forms of transport and are cost, congestion and availability of parking adequate disincentives? And for anyone who's brave enough on this panel, I'd like views on congestion charging and workplace parking as well, please. Who's brave? <laughs> um, I think that the um, idea of congestion charging should not have been ruled out within the uh, consultation on low emission zones. I think we should seek views on that. Um, I think, again, workplace parking levies are a success in Nottingham, I believe, um, and should be considered. And you can use that in. in alongside uh, setting up again Sally Sacrifice schemes for public transport season tickets. Um, and you can work with Travelling Scotland to provide everyone within an LEZ with a, a, a greener travel plan. So that yes, you're maybe reducing the parking availability, you're maybe saying there's a cost to bring your vehicle into city centre, but you're saying there's a financial benefit by travelling by public transport, and here's all the information you need to make that easier for you. Um, so. I can understand that it's maybe not it, the the, the um, appetite for it is um, something we'd need to look into, but I I, I think there's, there's certainly positives. Um, firstly, on the question of um, whether the cost incentive is enough. Um, I think Sustra and Scotland would advocate more a ban on vehicles of certain pollution standards. So rather than there being the facility for somebody who can afford it to 
pay that money to take their polluting vehicle into a city. There should just be certain standards below which that vehicle is not allowed into the centre of town. On the question of parking levies, uh, perhaps not as, as brave as the committee may hope to say, but I think they definitely should be under consideration. Um, but I don't think the question is necessarily just about workplace parking levies. Um, it, perhaps a premises parking levy is a better way to put it, because quite often you see these large-scale um, out-of-town developments where people are encouraged to drive their vehicles to that have enormous parking facilities for people so it's so much easier for them just to drive than to consider traveling actively so i don't think that that's simply a question of um of of people's commutes to work um finally on the question of innovation i i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't say that such scotland see the solution as particularly uh, an innovative an innovative one it's it's one that exists and it's just a question of innovative implementation it is reducing the amount of vehicles in city centers giving that space to people who would like to walk and people who would like to cycle and just for public spaces for people to linger it's a holistic approach to the system but it is something that is already known it's not it's not a new idea uh, yes i mean I, I think just building on that point last point i think what we need well, the, the vision should be a sort of transformational change in our cities and our city spaces and the way they're used and the way people engage with them. And that obviously impacts on everything. It impacts on planning, it impacts on the pricing of different modes, it impacts on uh, the limitations or the access to road space for different modes as well. Uh, and um, uh, within that, I think the, the pricing issue is important, but it should be seen within that broader broader uh, framework. Um, I think the Atkins, Atkins Produced a report 2008 2009, which was looking at climate, this more climate change rather than local air pollution. Uh, in terms of cost abatement, the lowest cost options they identif identified included workplace parking levies and travel planning, actually requiring organisations with a certain number of employees to have a proper travel plan, which incentivizes certain types of behaviours. And we've seen some mention in the latest climate change plan of, of uh, workplace parking levies don't think it's strong enough there but I, I think we definitely see that as part of it and uh, as Paul was saying you know within Nottingham where this has been piloted that's that's proven to be a success as well simple things like travel planning so I think are important in terms of congestion charging again yes we'd be we'd be in favor of that it's about uh, creating as I said the incentives uh, making sure that the more sustainable mode and the more healthy mode is the lower cost mode and the more convenient mode forever possible. And so congestion charging, I think, is something we need to look at again in Scotland. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just going back to freight and the transport of freight in terms of and going back to modal shift almost in that regard, I hear people in the margins talking about transport by sea becoming more fashionable again and using our river structures and even occasionally canal infrastructures. Any comments to make on that? How likely is that to be where just-in-time delivery is not of the essence? Yes, it's certainly been looked at and is being looked at by a number of the major retailers uh, who see, you know, as city living changes and the increasing number of people living in flats, you know, single people, you know, single occupancy households increases, how they're actually going to deliver uh, and fulfil, you know, what people actually want in terms of what they're buying in terms of food and, you know, other sort of consumption. Um, water freight is being looked at. The point I would make, and it's not related purely to Scotland, it's a wider UK issue as well, is that a lot of commercial wharfage and the physical infrastructure to be able to do that on rivers uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, rivers within cities in the UK, has actually been lost because it's gone over to housing uh, development. And then you can almost actually get a vicious circle where you get housing developments on, uh, on an urban river which used to be an, an industrial area. Uh, there may still be commercial wharfage beside them, but then you get noise and environmental complaints from the residents about, uh, about the commercial wharfage beside it. So effectively, the, sort of the commercial wharfage operation gets hounded out. Um, uh, and I think, therefore, while there is space for exploration of this, um, it's not a likely solution in the immediate term. I know it's been done in some continental cities and mainland Europe that's been looked at, uh, but probably the reality is that um, it's quite a difficult thing to uh, quite a difficult thing to do for the sort of practical practical reasons. Is there an argument to be made in terms of st structure plans for preserving uh, commercial yeah. orphanage? Uh, absolutely, in terms of land use planning and structural plans and like you know the major uh, city plans, um, looking at preserving freight sites. 
uh, be that you know, road freight or also uh, particularly rail freight or water freight in terms of their latent capability and the realistic chances of them actually being brought up back into operation. Uh, I think that is enormously important because otherwise effectively you're just precluding that for a future generation, basically. Yep. Yes, thank uh, you. David Stewart. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr McCree will know that the, in the previous parliament, again, there, there was a major inquiry into freight by the TICC committee, which uh, played a small part in. Uh, but one of, the, one of the areas that I found personally quite frustrating, both for rail and for sea, was that there is excellent um, grant funding and freight facilities grant, but at the time, and this may have changed, uh, for a four-year period, there had been no applications successfully for freight facilities grant. So, I mean, it seems to me bizarre that we have the funding, but the operators were saying, particularly ports, that it was so difficult to make the application. I think Montrose was the last one that was successful, that, uh, that they basically gave up on it. Um, but this seems bizarre, because obviously this helps our climate change targets if we can get freight off the road onto rail and onto sea. Um, and in fact, going back into time, I mean, that was the whole purpose of the Caledonia Canal, but there's next to no freight on that now, where, again, it seems to me immensely frustrating that it's not used more uh, for freight. Well, as FTA, we, we support uh, use of um, all modes uh, for, for freight transport, where it's, you know, obviously economically and also environmentally sustainable. I, I give evidence to the freight transport inquiry, like you say, and um, also played a part in actually getting back freight facilities grant when it had previously been cut in a couple of uh, budgets within Scotland. It's worth noting that England has completely cut freight facilities grant where we, we still do have it in Scotland. Yes, you're absolutely right. There are frustrations and issues with the practical process. It seems wrong that there's a public pot of money available and yet it's actually undersubscribed. Um, the reasons you quote for why it's undersubscribed are, uh, you know, are, are correct. There are problems and issues with uh, how um, the applications can be made. Bearing in mind, though, the grant is delivered under um, a system that has to meet EU state aid guidance. So obviously, it's the UK that holds the uh, permission. It then devolves that in terms of administration to the Scottish Government within the territory of Scotland. Uh, but obviously, there are some quite complex rules that, that has to be administered under, which I think partially explains it. But yeah, I totally take your point that there's um, a frustration about about, about that about that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, several panel members have referred to planning and its importance already this morning. Um, the Royal T uh, Town Planning Institute oral evidence to us um, focused on the need for further training of planners and the mainstreaming of air quality international planning framework. Um, I wonder if there are any comments either on that or on the cumulative impacts of emissions and whether they're adequately evaluated in, in um, planning development and what priority should be given to air quality when making planning decisions. don't have to answer all those, but if, they, if there's any comments, that would be helpful. Uh, I think we, we view it vital that if we are looking at a local authority partnership, that the planning department is involved in that you, uh, and that you... Uh, work together to make sure that public transport is considered at the start of any planning development. Quite often I hear from members that there's been a new housing development, for example, and it's impossible to serve it by bus because there's just not the, the room or the turning circles or um, it just hasn't clearly hasn't been thought through. Uh, and, and so it's involved the planning officers at that early stage and, and make the case for sustainable and active travel uh, and ensuring there's maybe a, a, a travel hub so that you can cycle to, to get a bus or, you know, it's, it's accessible. Um, it maybe discourages car use even, if you, as far as that. Um, it, you can see real benefits. Yeah, the um, Sustra and Scotland see the products of a planning system right now where it is unheard of that there is a new housing development that you cannot drive your car up to and you are quite welcome to move in, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a walking or cycling route to your school or to a shop or somewhere, something like that. Um, there needs to be an infrastructure first approach to the planning system by which all of these facilities, whether that's for active travel or for public transport, is in place before the houses are occupied. Yeah. I was just going to add, I mean, I think I'd... I'd um say the same thing about you know uh, retail and you know other developments from a freight point of view that it's really vital that the delivering and servicing needs of those uh, outlets are properly planned in at the early development stage so that you know freight is considered as an integral part of that rather than as any form of afterthought because obviously 
those areas are going to generate a large amount of freight, both inbound and also outbound, uh, and it's important to plan that in at early stages. Right. And anyone else? No? Yeah, I, I think the, the action set out in the Clean Air for Scotland strategy, and there's about six on planning. Um, uh, you've, you mentioned a couple of them. I think they can't, can't really argue with them. Um, I'm not sure what they'll really mean in practice. I mean, ensure future re revisions of Scottish planning policy and national planning for it would take account of the Clean Air for Scotland strategy. What does that actually mean? Yeah. What's the impact of cumulative numbers of small developments in terms of air quality, mm -hmm. where you know th this maybe not factored in the right way? Uh, but but I think I mean. I was, I was involved in a small way in, in previous iterations of um, the National Planning Framework Review and the Scottish Planning Policy. And what we have now is stronger, say, on carbon and on a range of things than previous iterations of policy have been. The challenge I always have is that when you actually see what's happening on the ground, there seems to still be a very big disconnect. So, you know, you'll see the Aberdeen Western Peripheral route going up. I can imagine there's already a lot of pressure for new retail developments, new housing developments. Uh, around Aberdeen. There's no public transport in terms of rail uh, in most of these areas, very poor bus services. The actual design, as, as colleagues have said, in terms of uh, uh, making biking and walking the healthy options, the most desirable options within that, linking it to schools and facilities and shops locally in a way that you don't have to use the car and so on. I, I just don't see it tracking through. And I know there's always a delay in the planning system, but uh, we really should be seeing better than we're getting now in terms of current development. Mark Roscoe. Just, just to develop this point a bit further, I mean, what, what is your impression of the local development plans that local authorities have in, in Scotland at the moment? I mean, are they actually adequate for designing out air pollution and designing in active travel, bus links, appropriate sustainable transport? And is there a mismatch between local development plans and a lot of the transport strategies that councils are, are working on? Um, well, I think the basic answer would be, be yes, there is a link. I mean, I think the, we do have, given the, 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 the scale of a lot of LDFs, a lack of that strategic maybe overview uh, in, in some ways. Um, and also, I think, while the, as I said, while there might be some decent aspirations in terms of the objectives of local development frameworks and so on, it's questionable how that's then applied to decisions about individual uh, developments, housing developments. Uh, retail developments, etc. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think there's there more qualified to talk about the detail of that, but that's just my perception, really, certainly. Just on that subject. I mean, we've been told at other times in Parliament that there's a, a distinct lack of planners, planners available, but I find it remarkable what you're saying, that there aren't sufficient planners to elegantly plan for um, all of these things that we're asking. Um, and that, that I understood that would be a given, but I'm dismayed to hear you say that it's far from it. Um, I don't think I, 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 I think there are pressures in planning departments. That wasn't I wasn't trying to make that point. I was saying that the either the, the committees who oversee this within local authorities um, uh, are not necessarily following through always on the the, the, the detail, or that the either that or the, the framework is written in such a way that um, it's on the basis of have regard to this or whatever, and that gives an awful lot of leeway for decisions, and that maybe uh, individual decisions may not seem as being too controversial, but the overall cumulative impact is, is something that is not contributing to a, a sustainable settlement in that sense. Thank you. Um, Mark? Just to follow up on, on, on this point with Alex Quayle, I mean, who should pay for that upfront infrastructure? Because clearly if you build a new housing estate, and it is a bit disconnected from a town and transport links. That, that's a problem. You move in, you start using your car, you're very then, you know, unlikely then to move to other sustainable forms of transport. So who, who pays for that? Should that come as a cost to the development industry and reflect it in house prices or as a public investment? What's the balance of, of investment that's required there? Should it be industry? Regarding a precise balance, um, I couldn't say, but there should definitely be more of an onus on developers for this. It's possible to prove a link between higher house prices and having good walking and cycling links to schools and shops and local amenities. Um, especially if uh, a developer wants to establish a new community in an area where these links do not exist, I think that is a cost that should be borne within what they are hoping to reap from the profits of it, yes. 
Thank you, Camille. And finally, on the theme of adequacy of the um, Scottish Government's approach, could I turn our minds to um, uh, the views of the panel on whether the um, Cycling Action Plan and the National Walking Strategy, um, uh, CAF's two key actions for active travel, are adequate? And um, are we going to make the um, 2020 target of 10% um, uh, of all journeys by bike, um, and if not, what could we do to be more sure that we will make it? And we've, we've, I think we've, in a sense, covered um, walking and cycling spatially in terms of planning, but if there are any final comments on that, then great. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Perhaps Alex. given that Cap specifically uh, referenced, yes, the, the cycling and walking uh, chat first. Um, I think for how we hit that target, maximising the amount of people walking and cycling is targeting the short, easy journeys in urban areas. So it's modal shift from those short, um, instead of, instead of your, your five minute drive to the shop, it's a 10 minute cycle or something like that, or even in urban areas actually, without complicating things too much, you might quite possibly be quicker on a bike. My point would be that by targeting the urban areas where you have maximum population, maximum capacity to get benefit from infrastructure and behavioural change programmes, that is the quickest way that you will see uh, an increase in the proportion of people walking and cycling for everyday journeys. I'll ask you what you mean by targeting in that sense? Um, by targeting, I would say making the facilities available to people. So putting infrastructure in the places of high population density. Uh, having behavioural change programmes where they're going to hit large communities, so whether that's a school or a workplace and things like that. Come in on this point. Yeah, just picking up on, on, that, um, on that point, uh, there was a debate in, in the Parliament Chamber uh, last <coughs> week uh, on the promotion of active travel, and many of the speakers, uh, mainly opposition speakers, I have to say, um, were, were not convinced that there would be an increase in the modal share of cycling to... 10% uh, in the next two years. Um, however, the, the government have committed the, the extra £40 million uh, to deliver that. Um, where do you think that £40 million should be delivered? Do you mean where geographically or on what sort of uh, projects? Well, both what projects. Well, mainly projects. You know, what, uh, where should that money be targeted to make the, make the difference? So one of, the, um, one of the first products that we've seen is this is the funding of the five community links projects, the um, uh, large scale um, active travel interventions, two projects in Edinburgh, one in Stirling, one in Glasgow and Inverness. Um, these are transformative scale. So uh, instead of being small, uh, small measures, um, they will they will offer a completely different neighbourhood to people who are living, who are commuting along these corridors. Um, and it's that level of transformative change that I think is, will be necessary. Um, and that level of ambition, I think, is, is, now, is now possible with the increase in the budget for active travel. Um, it's also important to remember that infrastructure is key to uh, modal shift, to getting more people to choose to walk and cycle. Um, and without that infrastructure, it's difficult to persuade people. But the behavioural change programmes that organisations such as Sustrans, Cycling for Scotland, Path for All run, um, they do make a lot of difference to catalyzing that change. So whilst it's going to be very important that we see uh, better infrastructure from that funding as well, complementary measures such as helping people to overcome their personal barriers to active travel will be equally important. Do you reckon we get 10% in two years? Um, I'm not sure. We shall wait and see. All I will say is that there are a lot of people working very, very hard on it and making good progress. On that issue? Yes, I mean, um, as I was saying, I think there are, there's a lot of good stuff going on. The increase in funding is very, very welcome. Um, I think in terms of 2020, it's probably too little, too late. Uh, I'd be very surprised if we meet the 10% by 2020, given where we are now. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't be redoubling our efforts to do that. Uh, I think the sort of things we'd like to see more of is um, along the lines of what's already in London, uh, cross-city segregated cycleways in all Scotland cities. I think that would be a big step and a, and a very bold step and statement about, um, uh, about the priority of cycling in cities. 20 mile an hour zones, I think, help in terms of reducing the, uh, 
the fear factor of cycling and so on. I think there is a big engagement and um, uh, uh, public uh, conversation that has to be had around cycling because a lot of people, uh, despite the fact it's a low cost and a very healthy way of travelling, uh, are, are, are maybe resistant to it and so on. So there needs to be encouragement uh, around that. And I think the 10% 10, 10 spend target, either for the Scottish Government, you know, we've moved up to 80 million. I think we still need to go further than that. Uh, I think local authorities, Edinburgh's leading the way in this, need to go uh, up to 10% and think about cycling in a way. And I think in Edinburgh, where we've seen that bigger spend for longer, we've, um, uh, we've, we've seen an increase in cycling in a way that we're not seeing in other Scotland cities. So it shows it can be done. And I think underpinning it all really is this essentially a transformational vision. You look at comparable European cities, whether it's your Copenhagen's or Groningen's and so on, 30% cycling Copenhagen, as big as Glasgow, if not bigger as a city, 25% um, uh, pedestrian as well. So a, a very big active travel uh, 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 contribution to the overall modal share within a very big uh, developed city with all sorts of things. And that's been good not just in terms of public health and in terms of transport, in terms of emissions. It's also been good in terms of quality of life in that city. It's a city people want to invest in, want to send their kids to school and want to live in. Businesses want to come in there as well. So I think, again, we need to think about the vision and the, the, the spending on, on cycling really fits where that fits in with all of that. And lots of other things around placemaking and planning we need to do in partnership with that to, to really deliver that transformation. Before we move to um, Mr. White. Uh, it's interesting that the focus has been more on cycling, but there is a national walking strategy as well. And just very briefly, because we have a considerable amount of questions still for you, just to warn you, um, could anyone comment on the walking strategy? Because we, don't, we can't forget it. I'd say on that, is that you know, 2020... In terms of its adequacy? Um, uh, well, I think it's a good first, good first step. I, I think you know, it, the problem I have is that we, we actually don't even think of walking as a transport mode a lot of the time. Walking is 20 to 25 percent of journeys, as has been alluded to before. 50% uh, of journeys in urban centres are less than two miles, 80% less than five miles. Mm. Huge opportunities there. Um, uh, as I said, I think it's very welcome. Um, let's see how it tracks out in the next few years. Right, just briefly, Mr. White. Oh, right, sorry. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about the transformational culture change in other European cities. <laughs> Has this actually had an impact, though, in terms of reduction of NOx and PM10? Do we see the same kind of air quality problems in those European cities or, or not? Can, can you confidently attribute that to walking and cycling? I think the way I see air quality is, is part of an overall sustainable city, overall sustainable transport approach. So I would say the fact more people are cycling is good in all sorts of ways. You know, it's good for public health more widely, good in tackling obesity, inactivity and so on. It's good for the quality of life. It's good for the atmosphere within a city, actually, if you go to these places as well. Uh, in terms of air quality, uh, I couldn't actually point to... Uh, you know, the evidence one way or other on that, so I'm sure others would be more qualified to talk about that. Mm -hmm. caution. What's your reaction when, when you hear that uh, a major road infrastructure, such as the Mabel Bypass, is being constructed and there's no provision for cyclists or walkers on it? I'm familiar with the um, uh, bypassing question. Um, However, Sussex and Scotland regularly find themselves in a position where they are responding to uh, consultations or even decisions like this, where we are trying to make a case that uh, walking and cycling's prominence or safety has been diminished for the expense of what seems to us to be a very small reduction in journey times. Uh, and that does seem to be a, a common problem. OK. Uh, Paul White, my apologies to let you come back in and respond. Uh, not at all. I was just cheekily going to maybe pitch for some of that active travel budget. So say that, um, I think part of um, encouraging walking and cycling is not to just focus on that as, a, as the, the full, that mode for the entirety of the journey, but linking up. Uh, so if you have investment in bus shelters and investment in cycle racks and bus shelters and higher cycles, and then you integrate the journey, so you're not, no longer having to consider the five, ten minute journey, but you can be, that's the first step to a longer step. Um, you can m maybe see uh, 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 a small rise in the number of cycling. Okay, thank you for that. Let, let's move this on a little bit. Um, Sustrans uh, noted in, in uh, written evidence that the <clears throat> legal requirement to protect people in local air quality management areas, and I quote, is vague and there is no penalty for failing to reduce harmful air pollution. And it further states, and again I quote, this is a question of insufficient powers, resources, or uh, 
accountability. Um, it, it, it's apparent that necessary local action or your pollution is not inevitable. <clears throat> can I ask if there's any examples where, that, that you can provide where a lack of resources have actually manifested themselves and no action being taken when it was clear it was required? The point that I hope that the consultation is making um, is that there is a lack of examples of um, interventions uh, into local authorities. So local authorities um, have to act with air quality management areas, but what they do is often quite small measures. It may be something like relocating a taxi rank. Now, whilst that would um, quite possibly reduce the spike in air pollution, it's not actually reducing the ambient air pollution. So whilst there is an improvement there, it's, it's, it's not to the extent that you would hope for. Um, the lack of examples of um, uh, interventions from a higher level is, as far as I'm aware, um, the powers that SEPA have to direct local authorities um, have never actually been exercised. Um, so it's hard to know how effective they would be. Um, and secondly, um, such and Scotland would argue that this threshold for action may well then be too high. Um, if SEPA has not seen the need to act yet, and yet we're seeing an increase in air quality management areas, um, it may be that um, the standards that are um, considered for an intervention in air quality in a local authority are too high. Um, but it's not saying definitively that that is the case. I just think it's something that uh, should be under consideration. OK, so, so essentially there's a, a gap uh, in the ability to act, who should act and on what basis they should act. I think there's a, definitely the potential for the gap because the system in place is, is untested. Does anybody else wish to comment on that issue? No? OK, what, what, moving this slightly on, uh, just to cover um, the issue of whether targeted support for upgrading to Euro uh, V6 commercial vehicles would improve uptake with it, uh, without a support scheme, how long would it take to convert Scotland's commercial fleet? And, and I guess the other question that sits alongside that, when these vehicles are effectively taken out of service, what happens to them? Are they scrapped? Are they sent off to other parts of mainland Europe? What actually happens? As I said earlier on, um, you know, Euro 6 and Euro 6 compliance is coming sort of naturally with fleet replacement. The issue is going to be fleets which keep their vehicles for a longer period of time or small to medium-sized operators, as I've said already. Um, obviously, what it, there is an issue with uh, LEZ, it's one that we've flagged up, I think, in our written evidence, in that bringing it forward when there's still not you know, that amount of vehicles physically available is, is, going to be, is going to be a challenge. What happens with older vehicles taken out of service? Well... Anecdotally, there's evidence that a lot of uh, these older vehicles that don't meet current standards are ending up in uh, parts of uh, Eastern Europe, out with of the EU. Um, but there's quite a sort of second-hand market there, so you know, arguably, sort of the pollution issues are actually being shifted to elsewhere. Uh, so, yeah. I understand that's what's happening with some diesel vehicles in Germany that are being shipped to Eastern Europe. So it's not really taking the problem away; it's simply moving it somewhere else. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. <coughs> a, a comment. Um, I think um, a lot of operators would say that they, um, when they buy a vehicle, they expect the lifespan of that vehicle to be between 10 to 15 years for a bus. If you are introducing uh, new standards, the, uh, maybe the, the depreciation of that vehicle is no longer over that, but it's over a shorter period of time. That can, that's a, that's a, a cost pressure. And the second-hand market uh, is then also affected because you've got uh, suddenly a flood of vehicles that are no longer suitable for use in certain areas. Um, and at the same time, because low emission zones progress is happening at the same time as uh, England Wales are looking at clean air zones, the build capacity through bus manufacturers is, is limited. You know, even if you had the money to invest in uh, accelerated fleet investment, then there's maybe not the capacity to actually provide those vehicles. Okay, thanks for that. We'll keep this moving. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, um, thank you, Convener. And in regards to a previous uh, question, Mr McRae mentioned uh, the excellent freight and rail distribution facilities in my Uddingston and Belsall constituency. Can I thank him for that and encourage people to come along and visit Belsall? Um, previous oral evidence has shown that there is abysmal 95 air quality monitors across Scotland. That's three per council. SEPA has only two trailer mounted monitors and additional equipment. Air quality data can't easily be presented or, or shown in real time. 
Uh, do you believe that uh, existing monitoring stations are in the right places, collecting the right data to provide a broad picture of air quality across Scotland? Should there be more monitors, broader coverage in areas required? I would agree with you. Um, I would say that to um, make a case for an LEZ, it should be very much evidence-based, and that evidence should be as, as accurate as possible, as, as up-to-date as possible, and maybe um, that's not the case, I believe. For, well, to give some anecdotal evidence, I know that in, in Hope Street, which is one of the streets which would fall within a Glasgow LEZ, there's a, an air quality monitoring station positioned right beside a taxi rank where the taxis all sit with their engines idling. And so, you know, by, by nature, exactly what it's cited, it's, it's, it's spiking because there's engines idling right beside it. Um, but yes, uh, you, you do need to have the evidence. And so, to, to make a case for it, so there should be wider collection of data. Um, yeah, um, such in Scotland certainly aren't in uh, enough of a position to talk about the uh, science behind the monitoring um, or the modelling that will go into low emission zones, but um, we're supportive of modelling to make these decisions so that it is scientifically based um, and there's, there's less of an opportunity for um, uh, political decisions to be made on it. Um, what is, I know, debated is whether or not the modelling that Scotland has is correct. And again, Sustra and Scotland don't have the expertise to comment on it. But when the low emission zones are implemented, it is going to require uh, a wide level of monitoring to make sure that firstly that low emission zone is functioning correctly, but secondly is the modelling that's being undertaken um, correct and producing producing results that allow people to implement future low emission zones in different towns and cities that will be able to make a positive difference. you have just been there, Mr. Creel. Shouldn't it be a, a factor that we should? Um, would you agree that we should have a visible air quality information? next to the monitoring station, so that like, people like myself can, or, or the ordinary public can, can see what the, the, the data is rather than uh, hidden inside the, the machine. Um, so would that not make a, a direct impact on public awareness, behaviour, and you know, how could we encourage this? Um, I would certainly agree that public visibility of uh, air quality is a good idea. We have it on beaches for people, um, but of course there's so many more people breathing in the air in our cities than are having a swim, so it is somewhat surprising that we haven't yet. Um, there are various ways that you could do this, but I think simplistically one very similar way um, would be to what you see by the beaches are just signs in prominent places. Um, you should also have uh, systems that allow people to sign up for alerts, but I don't actually know what Scotland is doing on that. That may already be possible. The last, my last question through you, Convener. Um, how can we improve air quality um, when the design and roads? And, and I'll make a comment again, M74, M8, there is a pile of walking routes that have just been constructed in the 500 million pound project in my area. Uh, um, so I'm, I would encourage Mr Carson to drive through it. Um, should planning for actual travel be mandatory when designing roads? Uh, is the performance of vehicles affected by traffic calming? As we make vehicles go slower, does that not mean that the pollution stays longer? I think if I may, that, that's the point that I, I hope I've made earlier on um, from a freight point of view, um, that managing road space and managing traffic and traffic flows is absolutely key uh, to improving uh, emissions from vehicles, and I'm sure it's as equally true of, of buses. Um, certainly from a freight point of view, we want to see some form of you know, prioritisation measures for freight so that vehicles can get in and can get out of the cities as quickly and efficiently as possible. That obviously brings with it a cost saving, but it brings with it, more importantly, an environmental saving. I think you're absolutely right that that is something that needs to be designed in. OK. Uh, Emma Harper, do you wish to ask a Yes, question? thanks, Convener. Um, I appreciate you're not health professionals. Um, I'm a nurse and I am the co-convener for the Cross Party Group for Lung Health. So I'm interested in the health angle, but uh, which you can maybe give me some advice about, but um, we're looking at, you know, lung disease, heart disease, stroke prevention. Um, so the whole purpose of air quality to, is to improve it so we keep folk out of hospital in the long term. So I'm interested about the monitoring. Is there enough monitors? Uh, are we engaging with the schools enough? What are we doing with um, 
engagement with SEPA. Are you engaging with SEPA? Looking at school education, looking at you know other engagement to you know to raise awareness for the whole importance of air quality. Uh, Sutter and Scotland run an, a program called iBike. I'm sure many members of the committee will be familiar with it. It's currently operating in 12 local authorities in Scotland. Um, it is a holistic approach that's trying to get uh, more children to cycle to school. Part of that is um, working with schools so that they build um, uh, they build the benefits of that into the curriculum. Um, so whether in particular air quality is something that is covered in these curriculums. Uh, curricula. I'm not. I'm not sure. That would probably very much depend on the school. But it is. It is the type of thing that we encourage within that program. Yes, to make sure that um, schools are aware of it, pupils are aware of it, and their parents. Uh, a topic you explored. You just touched on. Should planning for active travel and uh, air quality be mandatory? So when we're looking at uh, installing uh, traffic calming. Uh, speed humps or whatever, you know, you, Chris, you mentioned that, uh, that there should maybe be uh, some allowance for, for commercial vehicles to, to, to bypass those calming. But when we're looking at attitude traffic lights, for example, that are being installed in my constituency, which will actually start and stop the traffic if they're speeding, sh should, should we be looking at a mandatory uh, input with regards to air quality and active travel when it comes to all traffic calming measures? <clears throat> yes, is the simple answer. I would say that um, when it comes to modelling uh, and the LEZ through, through, through CPA, I believe they're taking a, a very technology-driven approach to it, where they say, well, what happens if you replace all Euro 4 buses with all Euro 6 buses? And OK, that you, you get an answer to that. But model what happens if you phase the lights, if you introduce a bus priority through a certain junction and you bring uh, the average speed of the bus up just a couple of kilometres can actually half the amount of knocks that comes out of a vehicle if you can just keep that average speed up uh, and also keep the vehicle on an optimal drive cycle without having to stop start. Um, so really you do need to, you should be considering these things, you should be modelling these things to get the best approach uh, to, low, uh, to air quality. So just developing that point, would it yeah. be sensible in future traffic management circumstances to um, favour roundabouts rather than traffic lights or the development of roundabouts in terms of maintaining traffic flows? Is that such an obvious thing I shouldn't even be asking the question? But in fact, I can't comment on, I do not know about that, but I do, I can't speak to the effect, if, um, and to me it sounds common sense that, that that would be a better approach, but I can't, for example, I'm thinking in, of the example of Hope Street in Glasgow where the um, lights are phased as such and the, stop, the bus know. stops are in such a situation where there's car parking that it's difficult for a vehicle to, to navigate up the street. Uh, uh, so that's maybe not a situation for a roundabout, but it's a situation where you have to look at measures to allow the vehicle clear passage through that street and you'll see air quality improve before you have to think <coughs> about what, what, do we get, what improvements do we get by moving from a Euro 4 vehicle to a Euro 5 or a Euro 6. But just where there's a practical option to do that. It, it should certainly be modelled. You, you should have that evidence base uh, so if that's a, a, an alternative, you should certainly model for that, I would agree. Okay. I, I was just going to add those last couple of points. That it's obviously, I think, important that you know, the air quality impacts of traffic you know, design measures are properly brought in. I mean, Mr Carson mentioned about you know, traffic calming in you know, his constituency. I mean, some of that is to do with um, you know, safety measures and about you know, speeds of vehicles and appropriate operations on the A75 uh, corridor, which, you know, which we're involved in. So, I mean, there may be other more dominant themes such as safety in that case, but certainly the air quality um, connotations of uh, traffic management and traffic planning do need to be properly considered when they're actually being, being put in place. May I, um... May I add a point on that? Um, yes, uh, air quality concerns should be factored in when uh, talking about um, uh, transport planning. However, I'd be concerned about a debate that took into account uh, avoiding traffic calming measures or uh, maintaining vehicle speeds or even increasing vehicle speeds as a way to uh, reduce emissions. I think that there's a public safety question there that uh, that is being neglected, and there is a there is there is 
a similar opportunity to reduce emissions by having slower speeds and safer traffic and reducing the number of people's in people in vehicles because they're happier to walk and cycle. Has to be struck here, yes. isn't it? Okay, Mr. White, just maybe come back. To, to clarify that um, what I was speaking about with a, a, a speeds improvement was in an urban area where you're maybe looking at from moving from six kilometres an hour to eight kilometres an hour, such as the congestion in these city centres. So I don't think it's a it's, it's certainly a threshold that's well below even a 20, 20s plenty zone when I'm talking about increasing speeds. I, I think so what um, Mr. White and I are um, referring to would be responsible design. Mark Roscoe. The, there do seem to be two perhaps quite separate issues here. There's the first issue about the impact of maximum speeds and speeding, particularly in residential areas, the impact that might have on walking and cycling, and also the increase in emissions that studies have shown that you get from driving faster, particularly NOx PM10. Um, but then there's also the separate issue about average speed. My understanding of the average speed is that the point that you're making, Paul White, is that because of the levels of congestion we have in urban areas, that's actually dropping the average speed because cars are simply not moving. Is that, is that right? I mean, what, what exactly are the panel arguing for in uh, relation to speed? There was fantastic work by uh, Professor David Begg on congestion, <laughs> which, which showed that uh, average speeds in city centres in Scotland is falling about 1% a year. It's 10% over the last decades. And then, he, from, working from that basis, you can see how that impacts upon operating costs, it impacts upon the um, willingness of a, a passenger to use a bus because the reliability and punctuality is impacted, and you've just got a vicious cycle where it's, uh, um, it's, it's just decreasing like, like so. So I think, from, from, in terms of um, bringing up the speed of a vehicle or allowing it to smooth passage, so it's not stop-start, is, uh, is just beneficial to, the, to um, air quality, beneficial to um, the passenger as well. Yep, um, just the final question here was about whether the level of detail in the Clean Area for Scotland annual report is adequate to um, scrutinise the progress. minor comment on that but in, in our submission we, we sort of review the actions and progress in, in, against all the actions in the strategy in the last annual report and I think we struggled to identify whether some of the actions had actually been completed or certainly if they were in progress when when the end point of the progress towards delivery would be that's but as I said that I wouldn't want to comment beyond that anyway. Thank you for that. Um, David Stewart. Thank you. I move the panel on uh, to low emission zones we have debated this um, earlier on, uh, the panel will know that the government policy is to have a pilot in Glasgow in uh, a year's time and to have four by 2020 and thereafter um, to increase that around uh, Scotland as well. I suppose the first question is, do we need a pilot project? Alec Quayle. Um, it is not a problem to have a pilot project and I think that there are a lot of lessons on the modelling and the implementation that can be learnt from, from Glasgow. Um, however, um, the pace of implementing low emission zones has been slow. I think Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen all completed feasibility studies between 2010 and 2013. So we could quite possibly have already completed pilot studies by now and already be in a position to be rolling out low emission zones to all of the cities in, in Scotland that were, were deemed to need them with a good idea of what would be effective or not. Um, not opposed to a pilot project per se, um, however, uh, what would be more of a concern if there was too long was left to digest this pilot project without action in the other cities as well. Um, it was appreciated that a deadline or a target had at least been set within the low emission zone consultation of having them within four cities by 2020, I believe. Yeah. Phil Matthews? Yeah. Yes, I think um, nothing on pilots per se. Uh, but there are over 200 low emission zones across Europe already. We know we know the different models. We know the experience from 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 other countries as well. And uh, as has been said, um, Aberdeen and Edinburgh as well as Glasgow have already expressed an interest in this. And the air quality management areas in those cities, plus in Dundee, and in Perth as well, I believe as well. So, I, th I think um, the the progress does seem rather slow. 
Um, and if we're not even at the pilot phase yet, then what's the implications for, for the others? But we would like to see a rollout across the, the, the Scottish cities as soon as possible, really. Um, whether we need a pilot before that, I'm, I'm not so sure, actually. Uh, yes, I think from a freight point of view, as you'll have seen from our written evidence, uh, while we obviously have reservations about the, the focus on low emission zones as a way of delivering sort of air quality improvements, um, we would want to see the lessons learned from a pilot scheme, certainly from a freight point of view, at a very practical level, because there's a number of really practical issues and challenges that come up with a, a low emission zone, particularly in, in regards to freight. And certainly learning the lessons of that and digesting that before moving on to the other cities, I think, would actually be quite important to us. OK, Paul White. I think it's a sensible approach to have a pilot project. I think that it's, since we all knew that there was a 2018 date attached, that it was made it very difficult to we were unaware of what city that would be in until relatively recently, last month or the month before. Um, so there's issues around that, but the idea of a pilot project is sensible. Is there time to put a Euro 6 LEZ in place? For, uh, to my mind, it would. you can put in an LEZ and set the standard as, as Euro 6. Uh, you then have different options as to how you achieve that. And I think probably the most sensible one is to say that there will be a lead-in time before you reach that standard. So phase it in the average in uh, European projects and in London is four to five years before you reach that. If you want to shorten that, then you have to accept that there's, going, there's possibly going to be a cost. Um, either the uh, local authority, the transport authority, decides to contribute that through um, retrofitting, scrappage schemes, assistance with purchasing new vehicles, or that cost may be passed on to the passenger through operators having to increase fares to, m to mitigate the cost of accelerated fleet investment. Some have suggested um, that you may have a nominal LEZ in Glasgow in 12 months' time, but it won't be effective for years uh, later, to take your point on. I think it's just, I, it, it depends what you envisage an LEZ to be. I mean, I think if you have the structure in place where everyone knows what is expected of them and are working towards those goals, then I think that's probably a good starting point. And I'm, not, I'm sure that there will be uh, certain people even within this panel who have a different view of what an LEZ should be from its moment of inception. But um, you have to be careful not to undermine the sustainability of the alternatives to the car uh, if you're hoping to tackle car use. So if you set up an LEZ at Euro 6 standard, which means some operators may re remove routes because they don't have the vehicles to meet that, and then you look to then tackle car use, there's no public transport network for those drivers to then use because that has been undermined. So I think a, a sensible approach would be lead-in times. Because mm, it, it's obviously vitally important then that you, we don't end up reducing services in Glasgow and increasing costs, so people end up don't are not using the bus, but they're using car instead. Which you, you, you could have the perverse situation where you introduce an LEZ and it encourages car use. And I would certainly echo a lot of the principles of those points from a freight perspective, in the sense that you know freight has still got to be delivered and collected from those premises in the in the low emission zone area. And what we wouldn't want to do if there wasn't adequate lead-in times. I think lead-in times are really important here from a freight point of view too. But if if what we wouldn't want is a sort of per perverse um, unintended consequence of it being difficult to service that area from a commercial and retail point of view and that actually having a debilitating ec economic effect on the, on the area. I think um, absolutely timetables have to be realistic. Uh, as I said, I think the problem is where we're at now, um, when we, we might have wanted to progress more quickly up to the point we're at now, um, in terms of 2018 deadline than we have been. But I think it's absolutely absolutely vital that, uh, in terms of buses, that there is a, a support given to users to, to, to get over the issues that, that Paul's saying there, uh, to, to um, support is given to bus providers to invest in the, the buses that will actually meet this standard. I think that's, mm. that's, that's clear, and particularly with a short lead-in mm. time. We need that support from the government to help yeah. uh, bus providers do that. One of the crucial areas uh, is a discussion about whether private vehicles should be included in LEZs. The plus side is, obviously, private vehicles pollute as well, particularly older uh, diesel vehicles. The other side of the coin, to answer my own question, is that you're going to maximise resistance from local people in the local area about uh, the LEZ taking place. What, what's the panel's view uh, on the role of private vehicles in LEZs, particularly in Glasgow, because that's hopefully a year away? 
through the modelling that you've seen that is included within the uh, low emission zone strategy, which looks at the uh, level of pollution within a suggested zone, you would see that the uh, bus is the main polluter in I don't know, between a quarter and a third of the, the, the streets within that zone, and the private car is the major polluter within the, the rest of that zone. Um, to not include the private car would be... Um, it just wouldn't... It, it would not solve the issue of air quality in Glasgow. You, you, and, and you have to include it. <coughs> is that anyone else? Uh, mm. Yeah, I think pollution, pollution is pollution. I mean, obviously different types of pollution, but um, if a vehicle is emitting pollution and the aim is to reduce that pollution to a safe level, then mm. clearly you have to look at that. Now, how that is phased in, obviously there, there needs to be a conversation that needs to look at the, the evidence around that. But I think logically, yeah. any low emission zone should, should be against all polluting vehicles, regardless of the type of vehicle that they are. Yeah. I mean, completely agree with that. It is really important that you know, this focuses on getting the best uh, environmental outputs, and therefore it's got to target the vehicles that, you know, Contribute to contribute to pollution. So, I think you know empirically it's wrong to sort of exclude certain types of vehicle. I appreciate there's political considerations about private vehicles, but you know it's, it's something that's still got to be looked at. It would be wrong to just target certain types of vehicle or certain types of operation. Could I raise then another issue on on and buses and displacement? I think some of the evidence we see from some of the bus companies suggests that within an LEZ you will have your best practice uh, electric vehicles. And there'll be a kind of trickle down out with the LEZ. The older, more rundown vehicles will go to the rest of the area. It's a bit like what happens with Highlands and Islands uh, rail carriages, but I won't go there on that particular subject today. Um, I mean, that is a very re real concern. Uh, you might have, so you have best practice in the LEZ, but other parts of uh, out with the LEZ in Glasgow, for example, you will have older, more polluting vehicles. What, what's the panel's view on uh, that possibility? The question that was raised before, the issues raised before about possible um, dumping of old vehicles in other countries as well. I mean, clearly that's not a sustainable solution. Uh, it might, in terms of how the vehicles are used elsewhere, I guess, you know, there might not be the local concentrations of air pollution in the areas where they've been displaced to. So overall, you'd still have a gain in terms of air quality. But I, I would think the desire would be that this would, over time, lead to an upgrading of the, the emission standards of vehicles across that wider urban area, not just in the, in the zone itself. But okay. certainly that's something that would have to be monitored and assessed and responded to if mm. that was the case. Yeah. Uh, I'm conscious of time convener. Perhaps I close on this question. And I suppose the final point for me is, how can we best future-proof the design and delivery of LEZs to allow for the use of large and integrated data sets? So to give you an example what I mean by that, um, for example, vehicle uh, emission standards. As you know, there's been a debate about this, uh, not least from Volkswagen and BBC covered this, the difference between um, laboratory conditions and real world conditions. And obviously the data that we currently have by uh, Drive On Vehicle Licensing Centre. Should the <coughs> LEZ have a lot more complex data so it can help manage that? And we make sure we need to get the right sort of data. So to use an old example, we don't want to invest in a Betamax when it's a VHS world. Showing my age for that example. You wish to respond? Um, it's a difficult point that I mean that the, uh, <coughs> we always urge the Scottish government to be technologically technology neutral in its approach to um, where we're going to go with it. So, so don't don't. Uh, in, encourage investment in electric vehicles or, or biogas. We don't know the, the future is open and you, you, you just want to um, maybe look at investment in vehicles depending on their um, emissions performance rather than the technology that lies behind that. Um, and the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership is, I believe, is trying to certify the emissions performance of um, different retrofit builds uh, to assist you in, in having that data to know what level of pollution is associated with which image, but I, I, I don't know other to say that it's useful to have that data, but you have to remain technology neutral. I with the point that it's got to be very much output led and it's about delivering the best environmental uh, outputs uh, equally. Uh, monitoring, you know, real life monitoring of uh, emissions from different categories of vehicle is obviously what's, what's key to understanding the real world situation here. Yeah. Thank you, David uh, Stewart. Um, Mark Ruskell. Thanks, Kavina. I mean, just to go briefly um, back onto David Stewart's point about the source of emissions and about the types of vehicles that we may be targeting through LEZs and other other measures, are you?
confident that the modeling really nails the nature of the problem. So, I mean, Paul White, you talked about the, the source of emissions and proportion from buses, proportion from private cars. But what about the effects of congestion that perhaps private cars bring to the road network, which then can, as I understand it, impact on the average speed issues which you're, you're raising, reducing that, causing more delay? Is that, is that adequately accounted for in the kind of modeling and approaches that, that we see? <clears throat> Sorry to jump in, but no, no would be my response. Um, we would see an LEZ as part of a package of measures to improve uh, air quality, and amongst that would have to be measures to tackle congestion. Um, the modelling doesn't take the modelling that lies behind the Glasgow Pilot Project does not take in, that into account when looking at how to improve air quality. It's looking st strictly at engine standards and not saying, well, what happens if the same engine standards are there, but there's no, but they're moving freely, or there's, there's no cars in that area. Uh, so um, you really need to um, consider ways to tackle congestion. And that's maybe, it's not the, through just an LEZ, but through a, a, a statutory partnership between the local authority and bus operators, where the authority invests in congestion, uh, measures to tackle congestion, and the operator then invests in, in the fleet. So it's not all on one side. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I should say members may be aware of a, an email that's been sent regarding a, an incident in the uh, campus at the moment. We'll just continue with the committee meeting while it has been assessed. Uh, just if you're spotting that information coming through. Does anybody else want to respond to that point? No? Mark Roscoe, you have further questions? Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Hey, thanks, um, convener. This is a, a kind of tidying up question just to get, uh, get the panel's views on the record. Um, if I could drag you all back to the uh, bus service operators grant. Um, uh, as we know, changes to the payment rates introduced in April this year uh, mean that the low carbon buses now attract a lesser top up rate of 10.1 pence per kilometre. Um, and as I understand it, the, the, the reason for that was to keep within the, the BESOG budget rather than, rather than increase it. So um, can I ask the panel in, in what way you think the conflict between uh, increasing numbers of low-carbon buses and the reduction in the BESOG uh, grant might be resolved? And so that is the bus representative, and it really shouldn't be... Uh, <coughs> The policy should be aligned in such a manner that uh, if you are encouraging investment in green bus in, in low carbon vehicles through the green bus fund, that is mirrored through through BSOG. So maybe the BSOG budget should set a rate but not be capped um, to uh, allow operators to have that certainty for investment decisions. Um, we are looking at BSOG changes again for the coming year that we may change what is um, regarded as low carbon vehicles. You're in the the situation where you could have purchased a vehicle through the Green Bus Fund this year, which may not arrive because of the, um, the time it takes to, to um, build the vehicle and provide it. It may not arrive till, say, um, May next year. Meanwhile, BSOG changes to take place for April mean that that vehicle is no longer regarded as a low-carbon vehicle because the standards changed. So um, you, you really need to look at it holistically and make sure the policies are all aligned to encourage investment in that kind of uh, low-carbon vehicle. Okay. So, sorry, are you confident that that's been done? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think we've covered everything. I'm not seeing any members indicating they have any further questions to ask. Um, can I thank you all very much for your time this morning? I think that's been a useful exercise. If there's anything you wish to follow up on, you can do that in writing, although I would encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Uh, as I say, thank you very much for your time. Um, at its next meeting on the 14th of November, the committee will continue to take evidence as part of its inquiry into air quality in Scotland. The committee will also review its consideration of petition PE1636, which requests that all single-use drinks cups are 100% biodegradable. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.